Hey folks, Steve here with another Fatal Alliances video. It's been a little while since my last video, but for good reasons. I've been busy uh, working on getting a, uh, a new place to live, and uh, it's going to be an upgrade. We're, we're going to have a nice place, and uh, it's going to have a dedicated game room. A um, lot, of, lot of good stuff to look forward to, but there's a lot of things sort of spinning in that space that uh, is slowing me down from getting more of the work here done on the the video series a um, couple of just general update things so this is likely gonna be I'm hoping the last uh, video or maybe second to last video we'll see how far we get today uh, video for the, the playthrough of turn one um, and that's what the series kinda has always been about is I'm gonna play through an entire turn try to demonstrate as many mechanics as I can and then um, kind of go on from there with whatever I want to do more videos on. Um, so we're going to finish out a few things, and then my current plan is to do a couple of uh, additional episodes that are not going to be around this turn one playthrough and will instead just be demonstration of mechanics that I haven't gotten to because some of these things really only come into play uh, later in a game later in World War One, things related to like the tank divisions. Um, I didn't do any strategic bombardment and uh, I, I want to kind of demonstrate that so you understand how that works. So we'll, we'll see where we can get to on that. Uh, want to correct one issue or one problem um, that I had from a, a previous video or really all these videos. I had these pilot markers uh, set up where they were for the setup charts, but the reality is um, I was supposed to decrease the pilot markers here uh, because we placed the actual uh, aircraft unit. So when you build an aircraft, they kind of go into you know, I think they I think they just say in the rule book the repair pool or something, um, but you set them aside and then when you actually place them on the map you decrease the pilot and if you have a pilot available you can just put the, the aircraft unit straight on the map well at the beginning of the game you have a certain number of available aircraft units you have a certain number of pilots and it's kind of you know one for one you just go out and play them so really I, I'm pretty sure all these pilot pilots just need to be at zero because we use all of the pilots placing all of the at start aircraft um, at least I think that's the case and you know at this point I just moved all the major power markers down to zero. It's not really going to be impactful for any other videos I do at this point. But just something that someone pointed out to me, and, and they, were, they were quite right. Uh, when, when you place your aircraft from setup chart, decrease the pilot on the, the pilot uh, chart here. Um, again, if the setup rules say, oh, Germany has two pilots, but you have two uh, aircraft, units, you place those two aircraft, decrease the pilot uh, for the one-to-one -one relationship there. So just something to, to get out of the way. So now, uh, in this video, in, in the content proper, uh, we're going to be doing a couple of things. Uh, if we look at the sequence of play here, we're really kind of down towards the end, and we're looking at the peace phase, because we did our, uh, our morale. Um, if we look at the morale, you can see uh, that a number of countries have dropped from their original starting point. Um, Germany dropped as well, but they're doing kind of okay. Um, but now that morale is done, uh, we will do the peace phase, which involves checking for conquests of countries. Uh, this allied minor support is actually... Um, something that I think we can ignore. I tried to look this up, and I think it's something that is in World in Flames, uh, the World War II game, and uh, is left over from bringing this over, so I don't think we're going to have this at all. Mutual Peace, which you're almost never going to have in this particular game, uh, unless you do some kind of weird multiplayer setup. Uh, we'll look at Liberation, and then Surrender. But these things uh, are going to go pretty quick, because a lot of it's not going to be really super relevant. We'll do a victory check, that's super quick, and then we'll get into the political actions, which um, will probably be the bulk of the time we use today. So let me get a look at the map here again, and just right out of the gate, I'm going to 
take a note to say uh, if you want to look in the rules and go to uh, 13.6 of the rules there, uh, that is what we're going to be following along with. And it's going to go pretty quick. We're just going to go in order of the rules. And uh, I'll try to explain a little bit as we go what we're going to do. This is going to be a pretty simple uh, process for us. So during the peace phase, um, we, we're going to check to see if any political status of a country or territory has changed. Something to keep in mind, there is a difference between a country, either major or minor, and a territory. So a territory is a place that doesn't have a capital. Um, and I need to see... The Pacific's probably a great place for this. So Papua uh, does not have, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a territory because it's got a major power abbreviation here. It is a logically sort of delineated uh, area. But it doesn't have a capital like the Netherlands East Indies, the Dutch East Indies do. Because it doesn't have a capital, that makes it a territory. Otherwise, again, if it has a capital, then it is a minor country. So, Papua, territory, the East Indies, minor country, because of the capital. Um, so, we're going to be looking now in terms of uh, the peace phase, the conquest. So, so, conquest is basically officially changing control of a home country or a territory that you're at war with. Um, any conquering that is done is done by a major power. So even if minor country units do it, their controlling major power is considered to now be conquering uh, a territory that's uh, or minor country. Um, and technically all of this is supposed to happen simultaneously, but obviously because in real life you do things one at a time. We'll work that. So, uh, a note for territories: you can conquer a territory if you control every city and port in that territory, or you control every port and coastal city and every sea area. The territory has a coastal hex in, or you control every hex, uh, whichever comes first. And so, you know, if we look at Papua again as our as our quick example here, um, I don't believe that. The Admiralty Islands are part of Papua. I could be wrong about that, but uh, if it, if it's not, so you know maybe this isn't the best of examples. But um, if it's not, to conquer Papua, you would just need to control Ley and Port Mors uh, Moresby. If we look around at potentially some other territories, um, I'm not sure how many we're actually going to have to be able to look at. Uh, Aden, Aden might be a good one. You can see that uh, it doesn't have a capital. It has a major port, but it's not a capital. You can see that uh, Batavia is a major port, but also has a capital. Aden, by comparison, only has a major port. So Aden is a territory. If we were to capture the actual major port here, then we would conquer the territory, which includes this additional hex, because we will have controlled every city and port in that territory when it comes time for this conquest check. So, you know, we wouldn't need to actually move units into this space to uh, conquer the, the territory here. Now, um, when it comes to home countries, then you're going to basically need to conquer or rather control its capital plus every printed factory hex in that home country if it has one. Um, so again as an example here in order to conquer the Dutch East Indies, the Netherlands East Indies we're going to need to capture the capital. We need to take Batavia. Now um, it doesn't look like we need to control anything else. There are no printed hexes here, so if we can take the capital, that is all that we need. So in some ways, you know, you might figure it's easier to capture a, or conquer a minor country than a territory. It, it just depends um, on the situation. But on the other hand, if we were looking at Australia, just for a second, so in order to conquer 
uh, a home country, we need to control the capital. So the uh, capital of Australia is uh, Canberra here. You can note the, the city capital uh, icon. And then we would need to control every printed hex. And so uh, the only printed hex in Australia is in Melbourne. So we couldn't conquer Australia unless we took both of these hexes here. We would need both. Similarly, if we were trying to do very well in France, this is a you know probably an example we, we would tough be tough to see. We would need to take Paris and then make sure we get every other printed factory like in Lille, uh, Nantes, um, uh, Ruin has one. I think Marseille might have one. Yes, Marseille has one. So, oh, in Toulouse. So, it conquering in terms of a, a minor or major country really involves, you know, one again the capital and then their industrial base. Um, which, you know, yeah, you might leave some ports that are uncaptured, but if you conquer all the parts that most matter economically and politically to the country, then then it's going to be conquered. So, what are the effects of conquest? Well, we're going to find out. We're going to ru run through this because right now, with the game rules uh, as they are and the game situation at, at this point, the only country uh, that we can actually say is, is conquered or is going to be conquered here is uh, Belgium. And, and, you know, obviously the Germans have not only captured the capital and all the factory hexes, it's, I mean, it's captured everything. It's taken control of every hex that Belgium has in its main home country here. So, uh, the effects of conquest are removed from the game. All the, un, uh, all the conquered home countries, land and aircraft units that are in the conquered home country, well, we don't need to do that because we had eliminated them all, uh, and we've taken every hex anyway. Um, remove from the game all of its land and aircraft units not on the map. So if we were to look at that, uh, technically that would mean uh, these units, and I knew we were going to do this, so that's why I have them over here. So they are uh, here, potentially we're going to be in France's um, force pool, but instead I've got them sort of situated over here. So technically we're going to say that those are uh, removed from the game. Uh, remove pilots and aircraft. I don't need to do that. Remove any naval units in the force pools. Well, we don't have any to do that with. Um, then we would roll a die for each of its naval units on the production circle or in the construction pool or repair pool. And there would be a chance that uh, Uh, that they would be destroyed or, or transferred, and so, um, oh, and I guess this unit, honestly, I should probably pull off the production track. So we had one Belgian unit. I believe we need to take that off for it being conquered, I think. Let me, let me continue reading before I do that, but let's just make sure. Um... Okay, so let's just keep going through. So, uh, yeah, remove from the game all its landings and aircraft not on the map. Also remove, da, da 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 okay. So if there were naval units, we would roll a die. If it was one or a two, it becomes controlled by any major power the conquered major power chooses. Um, sounds like that would be, I guess, France would just pick. Um, there's a chance that... Uh, the conquering power could capture those naval units being built. Um, but again, Belgium doesn't have any. Um, any units from the conquered side in that country that aren't at war with the conqueror are now placed on the production circle to come back as reinforcements. If this is the first time the country or territory has been conquered, it loses control of every hex, which has already happened for Belgium. Um, Every one of its hexes occupied by a land or aircraft unit and their uncontested zocks become controlled by that unit's controlling major power, unless already controlled by another major power on that side. Basically, what all that, that really means is if for some reason uh, we didn't 
take every hex. If we had maybe stopped on this line, and this was left undone, um, then we would potentially gain control of these hexes anyway as the central powers, unless they were occupied by opposing forces already, which isn't the case. Um, so obviously if there were French units in Belgium, they would retain control of the hex that they're in, and so on, but assuming that they're, you know, that's not the case, and it's empty, the conquering powers are just going to get control of those hexes. Um, okay, so now that we've, we've kind of processed that, what we need to do, um, and I, I will pull this off here for a minute, So the, Bel the Belgians have been suppressed down. The, the regiment of guys or the, the corps that was going to be raised as reinforcements have been dispersed. Um, and uh, now we're going to look at incomplete conquest. So 13.6.1.4. So if a conquered major or minor country still controls at least one aligned minor country that was aligned to it prior to 1914, meaning at the very, very beginning of the game, then that major power or minor country is only incompletely conquered and fights on with its remaining units. I'm going to tell you that that is the case here for Belgium. You might go, well, wh wh what, where? Well, down here, sure enough, there is the Belgian Congo in Africa. That was controlled by Belgium at the beginning of the game. They do have a territorial unit here in Leopoldville, the capital of this minor country. And technically, Belgium and who's really controlled by France, retains control here. So, um, each country that is conquered now chooses a new home country for the units of its conquered home country. It may pick any uh, aligned home country aligned to it prior to 1914. So the Belgians... Uh, could pick the Belgian Congo, or if they're a minor country, they can pick uh, their major power's current home country, which would be France. And in terms of logistics, I mean, you know, let's say I hadn't completely annihilated every Belgian unit, which causes them, uh, sorry, to basically be removed from the game, which I'm calling removed over here for now. Um, if they had instead been forced to retreat, or they had been back here and I conquered the country, um, or got pushed back into France or something, um, those units, would, it, you know, it would just be easiest to say, well, France is now the new home country of that unit for the purposes of drawing supply and everything else, and that's kind of why you would do that. A conquered Commonwealth major power uh, may major power home country may instead pick another commonwealth major power so the example in the book is if Australia is conquered you could pick Canada um, which w I guess logistically would make sense or maybe you'd pick India um, if the unit's original home country is incompletely conquered and not yet liberated remove it from the game if a unit yeah the unit remove the unit from the game if it is destroyed well I'll just supply Units from incompletely conquered major power home countries may still be built with whatever production the major power retains. Minor countries, conquered or not, never build their own units. Incompletely conquered major powers have only half their normal activity limits. Incompletely conquered countries still receive annual additions to their force pool. So, uh, because of all of this, Belgium is not completely conquered. Um, if it was completely conquered, so now just looking at 1.5, um, you would remove its naval units from the force pools and all land aircraft units from the game. It no longer receives any annual additions to the force pool. Um, da -da -da -da. So right now, and it's going to be very few times when we see a complete conquering happen. Um, technically, oh, I should probably point this out. Um, technically, there are other countries being conquered right now. Uh, so we had the North Rhodesian minor country become 
uh, conquered. We also see Rhodesia, and it has become conquered by the Germans. Um, there's no units, really, that we can use. At least, I don't think so. Maybe there's some territorial units. Kenya. Ah, Rhodesia. Okay. So, uh, these units are going to end up getting pulled out. Let me just make sure there aren't any other ones. And you'll see why here in a bit. So I guess the one open question here is really, you know, because this unit was on the production circle, but these units were destroyed and went back into the force pool, are these guys gone forever? And I think that they are. So if, if these units had not been destroyed, and had instead retreated to France. We conquered Belgium, and Belgium declared its new home country to be France, and then we destroyed these units. They would return to the French force pool uh, and could be rebuilt thereafter. But because they were destroyed and in the force pool at the time that Belgium was conquered, meaning now, um, they have to be removed from the game because they're not on the board. So that's sort of a weird thing, and I'm sure someone you know, might come back and say I have it wrong, but based on my reading of the current rules, uh, that is the case. So this this could be confusing for folks, um, or if there's an issue with uh, how this is supposed to go, that would be how I would look at that. Um, It's just the, the contention between, you know, what you, the rules of effects of conquest say and incomplete conquest saying, well, they're going to fight on, but um, yeah, it just, it doesn't look like the, the case that these Belgian units can stick around. I think they're just gone now. Um, the only sort of side thing is that technically uh, we still have this guy down here, and he's fine as a territorial. It's just that, you know, he's not going to be a whole lot of good except to defend the Belgian Congo, basically in the name for the French uh, at this point, uh, since Belgium itself is is taken down. Now, uh, I'm going to sort of put a, a quick pin in what's going on, because I do want to talk about the territorial unit that is potentially changing hands, I guess, is the way I would want to look at this. So um, if you go in the rule book down to section 21.5, uh, it talks about territorial, territorial units. So when a home country is conquered, liberated or reverted, all territorials on the map in the force pool and removed from the game or immediately moved to the current owner's force pool. The territorials on the production remain there and when they arrive do so as reinforcement under the current owner's control. This means you can build territorials belonging to countries which you have conquered. Friendly controlled cities and conquered home countries are still primary sources for its territorials. So I believe that means that this territorial, these, this Rhodesian territorial unit is taken uh, out of the Commonwealth force pool and go into the German force pool. Now the Germans have other territorials here. They have a Pacific territorial, they have whoops, uh, Cameroon territorial. There's now a 1 in 3 chance that when we go to build a territorial, we're going to get this uh, Rhodesian territorial unit because we've conquered it. And what it basically is representing, if my understanding of the rules are right, is now that we've conquered Rhodesia, this unit that is a Rhodesian unit 
um, we now get the territorials where, where you know the Germans are basically finding some members, uh, some some people who live in Rhodesia who are going to support the the Germans against the British uh, now. So I believe that is what is going to happen there uh, for the territorial territorial unit. Um, yep. Okay. So we're going to go back then to uh, the original area of the rules. So um, that that's the case of uh, of the conquering of Rhodesia. Again, those other uh, African nations here down here that had been conquered by the Germans. Lots of conquering done by the Germans this turn. No other places currently fulfill that. Um, something to look at then is uh, we would look at the potential for things being re-conquered. So uh, if the French manage to push back and can take uh, the capital of Belgium and all the factories, they can potentially uh, reconquer Belgium. Um, now, uh, the French could then hold on to it and treat this as French-controlled territory, but what's likely going to just happen is that they will instead liberate it. So instead of being reconquered, conquered home countries and territories may be liberated, provided the major power reconquering it is from the side, uh, the other side from the side that conquered it. So basically anything that the central powers conquer, the allies can potentially liberate. Um, you can liberate a country if it existed in 1914. I'm, I'm looking at section 13.6.3 of the rules. Um, you can liberate a potential home country which didn't exist at the start of the game if you control any city in its potential home country and you would treat it as, as, as if it had liberated itself except you immediately revert all potential hexes you control to the new country. So if you're going to uh, uh, bring Belgium back uh, or, or rather, uh, let's say you're going to try to bring about Bohemia or something, um, or, I'm sorry, Czechoslovakia, then you will need to control uh, Prague, and you have to give all these potential hexes that are part of Czechoslovakia to, uh, to Czechoslovakia. Um, You may choose not to liberate a country or territory that could be liberated. If you do that, uh, then those partisans are going to be against you because you're not giving them freedom, basically. So, and then, you know, why would you ever do this? But if the French reconquered Belgium and didn't sort of restore the Belgian government by liberating them, then the Belgians are actually going to treat the French as hostile invaders at that point if they don't liberate them. Um, Completely conquered country is back in the game when its home country is liberated. Uh, it is at war with every major power its liberator is at war with. And then you get to return uh, units that are not currently in the game back into the force pools at that point if it's liberated. You know, in, in a lot of ways, liberation is basically just reversing the effects of conquest. Um, and... Uh, all major powers that give back hexes to the liberated uh, major power, if it's a major power, may cooperate with it, so that's good. Um, there's a couple other of minor sort of things to look at when it comes to liberation, but uh, it's really minor stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm covering it in this video, but it, some of it's just so straightforward that um, I, I don't know how much I want to cover of it here. Um, so basically, you know, you're, you're going to take the primary economic and political centers of a country. It will become conquered at the end of the turn, not during the midpoint of the turn. So Belgium did not become, quote-unquote, conquered until now. Um, and again, if the Allies wanted to reconquer and liberate Belgium, they would have to do the reverse, taking the capital and the, the factory hexes and what would likely end up being most of the hexes of Belgium if they're pushing in that far to get to this point. Um, other countries that may get conquered um, are potentially Serbia. There is the special rule that we need to take Skopje to do it as the central powers. So that would be one. It could come down the road that uh, Romania or Bulgaria, some of these Balkan countries, could become conquered. It's unlikely we would see a major power become conquered unless something really goes crazy, but it, it could happen. Um, but in this game, there's just not a whole lot of conquering and liberation going on. 
Um, again, maybe sans uh, minor countries liberating themselves. Again, partisans can form into home country units, and then those home country units, if they can take the capital, can then liberate themselves, and they become independent countries again. So that could happen to Finland. Um, can maybe even happen to... Uh, maybe Poland, I'd have to look that up, but uh, yeah. So there, there is this whole sort of thing of, like, the states of war is kind of odd. Um, and a little bit, you know, you have to keep that in mind. And that's because if you look at 13.6.2, there's this mutual peace and neutrality um, section of the rules. And it says that two major powers at war can agree to come to peace on any terms mutually acceptable. And then there's a neutrality pact in place. And a neutrality pact basically means that uh, units are going to be um, at peace with one another and that that neutrality pact can be maintained for a certain amount of a, uh, a certain certain amount of time based on the garrison value on the border between those two nations that were at war most of the time a neutrality pact is going to come into effect in this game when russia goes to civil war or uh and in that case the russian civil war has a bunch of special mechanics so i guess technically it's not a neutrality pact but I mean, let's say we, we forced France out of the war and they're now in a neutrality pact. You know, that's enforced by the morale rules. But 13.6.2 says, well, Germany and France could, if they wanted to, come to terms and sign a peace treaty. You can read the section yourself. It's only a few paragraphs. I don't think this is actually ever going to happen in a real game. And... Uh, You know, part, part of that is that um, the reason why that is is that Fatal Alliances, as opposed to World in Flames, is set up as a one versus one kind of game, like a two-player game. You could play it multiplayer, but it's always you win as a team. The current victory conditions of the game are you win as a team. So it doesn't make any sense for the... French to sign a peace treaty with the Germans, because if they do, that just gives Germany the opportunity to go send forces over to Russia. There's no sort of selfish victory condition driving the French to sign a mutual peace neutrality pact at this step in the game. So I don't think you're ever actually going to see that take place. Maybe somebody who has a better eye on strategy can tell me a, a situation in which, in which that would take place, but I'm fairly confident that that is just not the case. I don't think that's ever going to happen. This would happen in World in Flames uh, because ultimately you, you're looking at one country can potentially be the winner. And that's sort of based around bidding and uh, controlling objectives and all this other stuff, but the reality is um, you know, I, I just don't think that you would ever do this in, in, a, in a regular game here. It just doesn't really make sense for Fatal Alliances to sign separate new pallet, neutrality packs. You're going to have countries in it for the long haul because for one country to suddenly be at peace provides the opponent the ability in a reprieve from losses to reorganize units and kind of get things set up. So I don't expect that. Yeah, maybe 13.6.2 being in the rules at this point was a... You know, they're going to keep it around because maybe they'll change the victory conditions and they weren't sure if they were going to need it and it got left here. But again, I don't think it's actually going to be useful. Um, okay, so uh, there's also the surrender rule, 13.6.4. Uh, during any peace step, you may surrender the current home country of your major power if any of its hexes are enemy controlled and you have no in-supply land units anywhere in the home country. This would be treated as a conquest in all respects. Again, I don't think this one has a real place. Um, I don't think you're going to see this actually happen. Um, if there, if you do surrender, I have to imagine it is uh, an edge case for some really weird gamey thing. Because most of these countries that are at war in, in, in Fatal Alliances... 
um, are, are going to fight until the, the morale drop causes them to sign a neutrality pact. So I think this surrender rule is probably also a holdover from World in Flames. I don't think you would actually actually use it. Uh, something to note, 13.6.5, so this is going to be important because a country could drop out due to morale. When you come to peace with every major power, um, you'd be considered neutral again. You would move all your reserve and militia units that are on the map or on the production circle back to the reserve pool, um, and then you would move those units uh, from the game. But if you were to go to war again, they could come back. So basically, you know, for some reason... Um, or maybe not for some reason, I should say, you know, in the case of France, if France pieces out due to morale issues, any of its militia, like the Paris militia, um, I'm sure there's a couple elsewhere on the map somewhere, um, their reserve units are going to come off the board, um, and it's because they're essentially demobilizing. Not really a major rule, just something to keep in mind. Again, you're only going to see this really happen for some of the Western allies, not counting Russia, who might have to peace out due to morale issues. Again, Russia hitting morale zero means the Russian Civil War happens, which is a whole other thing that we may look at sometime. Um, okay, so <laughs> this is running a little bit longer than I thought it would. All okay, right, we're, we're past the peace phase, right? The only thing that really happened was Belgium got conquered, Life continues on. Oh, and the Rhodesia, Rhodesia's got conquered, but life goes on. Now we do the victory check. So, the victory check, you know, the rules say in 13.7 that, believe it or not, the current turn is over. Well, no, it's not over, but close. So we're going to look at, um, looking at uh, the, the counting of objectives. So objectives are these red print cities. There's quite a number of them on the map. Um, as opposed to World in Flames, where you're sort of wanting to capture as many objectives as possible for your country and for your side. Um, in this, it's a little bit more based around uh, getting, you know, the central powers retaining a certain number of objective cities or taking some from the, the allies and holding them as long as possible. So... Uh, so first we would do a check for an automatic victory. An automatic victory is only going to happen if uh, you control Berlin, Vienna, Istanbul, London, Moscow, Paris, and Rome. So if a side happens to control every capital of all the major powers, then obviously you win the game. <laughs> Uh, that's probably not going to ever happen. I, I don't. I don't see that happening unless something goes to ask, You know, incredibly wrong with the game, and you've managed to capture all the capitals. I, that's just probably not going to happen. Um, there is a way for the Allies to win an automatic victory, and that is if the German morale drops to zero. That's an automatic victory because that's basically Germany piecing out of the war. They can't go on. Their society is falling apart. Um, they will. You know, and Germany is really the driving force behind the central powers, and the game is basically over. If no one wins an automatic victory, you keep playing. Uh, and then it's saying you're, you're going to return the impulse marker to the first box of the impulse track, which uh, we will do. Um, and advance the game turn marker one turn. Uh, so we would move our turn marker right here to here. We're still in 1914. Um, if this was the final turn, um, and that's dictated in the scenario rules, basically I think the game goes on in 1919 actually uh, for the end of the scenario rather than just like the end of 1918, which makes it a little bit harder for the central powers. They need to hold on longer than historically. Uh, which is, it's already pretty tough to do that. Um, and what you would do is you would look at the objectives. And this is where some of that stuff related to Japan plays into effect. So at the end of the game, you add up the objectives controlled by just the central powers. Again, this is different than World in Flames, in which you're counting everybody's objectives and figuring out some calculations. Here you just want to know how many objectives are controlled by the central powers. If the central powers control at least 16 objectives at the end of the game, or 19 if Italy joins the central powers, which means if you're going to pull Italy into the game, 
uh, on the side of the central powers, which can happen. That's going to increase the threshold the central powers actually need to win. So it might be one reason why you don't go after Italy. It is a central powers victory if they have that 16 or 19. Otherwise, the allies win. And you can kind of think of that as it's just going to depend on how the peace treaty goes, right? If the central powers are able to control this many objectives uh, by 1919, it's the allies finally saying we couldn't crack the nut, let's just all stop fighting, and maybe the German Empire isn't dismantled, and Austria-Hungary can continue to exist, etc. Um, otherwise, even if the central powers are controlling, you know, maybe it's just this little core of Germany, I mean, obviously, they, they've lost so many objectives, so many important cities and economic centers that they're going to be in really sorry shape when it comes to the negotiating uh, the negotiating a peace treaty, right? That's sort of how, what does that really mean? Um, you would not include any objectives controlled by central powers that conditionally surrendered at any point in the game. So uh, if uh, the Ottomans peaced out, then, you know, they're, they're out. They're no longer part of the central powers. You don't get to control their objectives, even if maybe they came back into the game. This is actually a rules change that I suggested uh, some time ago, and I actually, I think, originally suggested the Allies win automatic victory if German morale drops to zero. I won't take full credit for that, but I remember on the forums and in private messages with uh, the game designer, I actually suggested that, so they're at least in the current rules. Yay me. Um, but Japanese and Red Russian objectives count for the Central Powers at half value, so that means that uh, essentially the Japanese for controlling uh, Sang Tao and controlling Truk and Kwajalein, um, maybe that's it. Uh, oh, and uh, Taihoku. That's actually one, two, three, four, right now, divided in half, half value two. That's two objectives for the Central Powers um, because they played well and they got the Japanese out here taking things before the Commonwealth. The Red Russians, so if the Russia, uh, if the Russians hit morale zero and they go into civil war, which just has a really brief description of what happens, all the units are pulled off, um, there's going to be some uh, a huge amount of die rolling to determine which of these units become white Russian units, which of these units become red Russian units. But for all the objectives that are controlled by red Russian units, and those red Russian units are controlled by the central powers, they get half value. So if the red Russians can control St. Petersburg and Moscow, uh, they can get a victory you know, in a, a victory objective point, um, and so on. Odessa, they'd be looking to take. Zaritsyn, uh, they would be looking to take. There's only so many uh, objectives in Russia anyhow, but uh, that can provide objectives to the central power. So could be, you know, they want to do very well here so that even if they're starting to lose ground in the home countries, they've still got enough objective points to win the game. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think I'm going to do a, a cut here and do the next video as a separate video. Um, just because I, I've been talking for a little while, we're about to hit 44 minutes, and we just talked about uh, the conquest, which is kind of complicated, and some of these weird surrender rules and the victory check. Uh, I'm going to leave the political actions to its own video, um, which I'm just going to record here in, in a little bit. I'm going to take a break, um, but we'll do that next. So again, uh, when it comes to this, again, the, the change of political status of countries does not happen until the end of the turn during the peace phase. You conquer by taking capitals and factory hexes, or in the case of territories, where there is no capital. You want to take all the ports, essentially, um, which is the closest thing to, to cities as you're going to get in a lot of those places, um, or control every hex outright. Uh, any country that is conquered can be reconquered by the opposing side and liberated. 
Uh, again, that liberation, uh, if you refuse to do that or don't do that, may impact uh, the potential for partisans. And then um, there's still, like I said, there's sort of vestigial limbs from World in Flames that I don't really think have a place in Fatal Alliances in its current form. And so maybe not a whole lot to worry about uh, Worry about there. Um, again, incomplete conquest means that uh, a country that has been conquered has a minor country that it can rely on. And so uh, the only other example of that that would be obvious coming up will be if we conquer Serbia by taking Skopje, uh, the Serbians could actually designate Albania as a home country uh, if they wanted to. Um, and potentially any units that are alive on the board uh, can retreat back to Albania as a safe place. Um, but again, because these units, um, pretty certain, because they were off the map when Belgium was conquered, they're just gone. They're, they're not able to come back at this point. They have no safe haven. They've been conquered. So, okay, I think that's it for this video. Uh, we'll see you again in the next video very, very soon. Uh, if you like this video or this video series, uh, hit like, subscribe if you'd like to see more. I will be covering other games uh, in the future and doing other sorts of videos down the road. Uh, so until then, catch you later.